Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Larry Schwartz, Secretary of the Governor. Thank you for being here this morning. Uh, we're here to talk about the passage and enactment of the 2014-2015 New York State budget. This is the fourth budget under Governor Cuomo, and the fourth time in a row, the governor, working in a bipartisan fashion with the legislature, has delivered a budget that is balanced, fiscally responsible, and on time. I want to acknowledge the hard work of the elected officials joining us here today, along with their colleagues in the legislature. We have Senate IDC leader Jeff Klein here today, Senator Kemp Hannon standing in for Senate Majority Leader Dean Skelos, and of course, Assembly Speaker Sheldon Silver. I also want to just take a point of privilege to thank a few other people that are here today. First, I want to thank uh, the other secretaries who I work with very closely day in and day out to help fashion a budget and get it passed on time. Jim Yates in the Assembly, Rob Mohik and John Emmerich. And I also want to take a special point of privilege of thanking uh, my own colleagues in Governor Cuomo's office, especially Budget Director Bob Megna. This is Bob and I's fifth budget together. Uh, there's no better professional than him, and I really appreciate the amount of uh, months and hours and days that we work together on the budget. But I also want to thank, and his staff, of course, all the professionals in the Division of Budget that work tireless hours along with the staffs in the Senate and the Assembly. I also want to thank Mylan Dennistein, my partner, who's the counsel to the governor, and her counsel staff, who without them also, this couldn't happen, as well as the deputy secretary. So I want to thank everyone. A lot of unsung heroes out there that work uh, all day and all night uh, to help get a budget done. Um, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to Governor Andrew Cuomo. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Larry Schwartz, who did an extraordinary job. Uh, on this budget, as did his entire team. I'm excited to be here today. I'm excited about the accomplishment. It is a beautiful spring day, and it is uh, spring for the New York State government. It is functioning. It is performing. It's uh, performing in a way that it hasn't literally in decades. It's our fourth on-time budget in a row. Uh, we're trying to come up with a metaphor for the fourth on-time. The best we can is a grand slam. Uh, last year, we had three on time. We called it a hat trick. Uh, but this is the Grand Slam uh, budget, and I'm, I'm pleased and proud to be part of it. Last time you had an administration team produce four on time budgets, you have to go back about 40 years. Governor Nelson Rockefeller, Speaker Perry Durier, Senate leader was Senator Bridges from Western New York, it goes back uh, that far. When you look at the budget, the budget is often a telling sign of how government is functioning or not functioning, right? Uh, gridlock happens when it comes to passing the budget. That's what happens in Washington. Why? Because that's where the money is, right? Willie Sutton, why do you rob banks? That's where the money is. Why is there gridlock at budget time? Because that's where the money is, and that's where the big decisions are being made. And you can see if it works or if it doesn't work at that moment. Uh, and it has worked. When you look at the past experience in budgets in this state, you go back over the past 30 years, 23 of the 30 years, the budget was late an average of 50 days, not a day late, two, two days late, almost two months late as an average. Just imagine that. So this four in a row is a symbol of a larger turnaround of government in general. The budget was also passed with overwhelming margins. In the Senate vote, it was near unanimous on many of the bills. In the Assembly, it passed by huge margins. And I think it makes the point that this is truly a bipartisan budget. It's a bipartisan plan for the state of New York. And you see that in the margins. And it should pass uh, by large margins, because this was a collective effort. It was a cooperative effort. And it is a smart plan for the state of New York. It's driven by the fiscal discipline of the 2% spending cap. The 2% then produces revenue for us to make wise investments, uh, to make additional tax cuts, which I believe are fueling New York's economic turnaround. We have a property tax cut in this budget that I'm very excited about because it addresses a chronic 
problem for the state of New York, which is high property taxes, not just high within the state, but high nationally, some of the highest property taxes in the country. And if you ask about the competitive disadvantage of New York State, to me, it is the property tax. And property tax is about the growth of local governments. And that is a problem that has plagued this state. FDR uh, pointed to the problem of the high cost of local governments. Uh, so this budget actually takes a reform step towards doing something about the cause of property taxes. We invest in education with a 5.3% increase. Uh, which is much more than any growth formula would indicate. But what it manifests is our belief in investing in education. Uh, and 5.3% in this economy, in this environment, is a massive, massive investment. Uh, you know, some people say it's never enough. But maybe it is never enough. But 5.3% by any realistic scale is a great investment. Big step towards universal pre-K, which we're excited about, statewide protection for charter schools. We stopped premature testing on the <coughs> Common Core agenda, which was creating great anxiety among students. And we advanced the public trust with real enforcement gains uh, and enforcement in the Board of Elections, new bribery laws, new disclosure laws. Uh, accomplishing what we had started to set out to accomplish last term, which was bring more public trust to the state government. And most importantly, we got it done. We, we produced results. All of the great governors in this state had one common denominator. They were all about making progress. They were all about moving the ball forward. They were anti-gridlock, if you would. Uh, they would all, FDR, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, Rockefeller, Mario Cuomo, they would all talk about compromise to advance the goal. And inaction is the worst thing, and paralysis is the worst thing, and gridlock is the worst thing, and really the failure of government. And this budget moves the state forward. Over the past four years, we have moved the state forward. This state is a better state than it was four years ago. We started four years ago with this basic budget plan, 852,000 unemployed. Today, the state of New York has more private sector jobs than ever, period, period. More jobs than ever. We went from a $10 billion deficit to a $2 billion surplus. Unemployment down in every region in the state. The state's energy is changing. People in upstate New York believing in their towns and believing in the trajectory of upstate New York again. So we have a lot to be proud of. It is not that we have accomplished everything. We have more to do. There's no doubt about that. Uh, and there are pieces of legislation that we would have liked to pass that we did not get passed. Uh, so the work continues. Uh, I would have liked to see the DREAM Act pass. We need to do more on the, in the area of public finance, which has been an ongoing effort. We need to do more and uh, come to a resolution on teacher evaluations and what we're going to do with teacher evaluations. So we have more work to do, but uh, it's, it's been a, a great moment of progress and the state has made great strides. I credit my colleagues. I credit S Senate Majority Leader Dean Skelos, Senator Kemp Hannon, his colleague and my colleague is representing the Senate Majority today. I credit them and their leadership and their collegiality. This was not an easy budget. This is not an easy time. Uh, and it's easy to fight, and it's easy to yell. It's hard to listen, and it's hard to compromise. Uh, and they did just that, as they have for the past three years and three budgets before that. I credit the IDC. Senator Jeff Klein is here representing them. Uh, he played a very positive and constructive role. Uh, his advocacy on public finance uh, served this budget well, and I believe is going to continue to serve the state well in the future. Uh, but I want to thank him for his leadership, and Speaker Sheldon Silver, who uh, once again has, uh, is in many ways the master of state government. And when we sit down, uh, the experience and the wisdom that he brings to the table is a tremendous asset. Uh, and his vision and his leadership uh, was a tremendous asset in getting this budget done, so I thank him. I'd also like to thank my executive colleagues. 
This is one of the probably the most exhausting tasks that you could ask a person to perform. Uh, I don't even know what the equivalent of it is. Uh, in the law of practice, when you have a closing, you'll have people work in a frenzy for a few days to get a closing together. This budget is a frenzy for weeks, where people are literally sleep deprived and uh, work around the clock for weeks. I've never seen anything like it. And it takes a certain commitment and a certain strength and a certain character to be able to do it. Uh, and my secretary, Larry Schwartz, and Bob Megno, who's been brilliant at the budget, and my counsel, Mylon Dennerstein, and deputy counsel, Seth Agata, and the entire team really has done great work. And as uh, Larry Schwartz mentioned, on both sides of the aisle and in both houses. Uh, Jim, Jim Yates and Lou Ansicone, uh, Rob Mejica, Kelly Cummings, the whole team has really done an extraordinary job, and I want to thank them for that. I also credit New York's leaders. Uh, we had leaders from across the state step up on important issues. Uh, the property tax uh, reform, which was very important. Uh, we had great leaders step up on a politically difficult topic, and I want to thank County Executive Mangano, uh, County Executive Joni Mahoney, uh, County Executive Pacenti, County Executive Centuli. They stood up and they showed leadership, Mike Hine, on the property tax cap, and I want to thank that, them for that. On the work on our Public Trust Act, the district attorneys were very helpful, uh, especially in crafting new laws, the new bribery law, and I want to thank District Attorney Rice and District Attorney Vance. I want to thank New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio for uh, his emphasis on pre-K, which he started in the campaign and I think helped bring that issue to the forefront. And I want to thank him. And most of all, I want to credit the people of the state of New York. Um, my political formula has been the same for four years. I believe the ultimate power resides with the people. And the challenge is, can you really get the people motivated and energized, and can you get them to speak up? Because when you can get them energized, the pol political process will follow the people if the people make their voice heard. Uh, and I went to the people once again on this budget on very difficult issues, and once again they responded. Uh, and I think that in many ways illuminated the path forward. The New Yorkers, when they come together, are an unbeatable team. And New Yorkers came together on every level to make this budget a reality. Team New York won the day, and I am glad that I am on it. Uh, with that, let me turn it over to my colleague, Senator Campana. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Um, obviously, I'm not as good looking as Dean Skelos, but let me just try to represent the Senate majority. Um, the Governor spoke about the, this is the fourth consecutive year of an on-time budget. I can't begin to emphasize enough what a big deal that is. Looking at this room uh, and looking at the people who work on that budget, there's so many people who don't remember the days when it was a hot, hot in July, it was 90 degrees out and we still didn't have a budget. Uh, there would be no agreement, everybody would go home and then come back again a week or two weeks later. This marks the fact that government is working in New York. It's an intricate, intricate thing to get done. The gears of the budget are uh, so interdependent with so many other things. Uh, people come to the legislature, people come to state government with their aspirations, with conflicting views, and putting that all together in a budget is a really big deal. So the governor uh, deserves a lot of congratulations because he made those gears work together, uh, cajoling, uh, talking around the state in uh, speeches uh, about the uh, state of the state and budget that never seemed to end, but, you know, it worked. It brought people the attention. <laughs> well, be, but yeah. without that, people don't know what the issues are and don't know what's at stake. And uh, we've had enough uh, self-appointed interest groups that uh, seem to occupy the space. There's a number of other things that happened in this budget, and I think uh, build for the future. Uh, the, the tax policies that were put in place. One, the property tax. Uh, yes, the, the, the equivalent of a freeze uh, property tax. Add that to STAR, you get close to $5 billion as to um, what the state is doing for the hardworking uh, homeowner. 
but also building for manufacturing in the future. Um, harmonizing taxes that didn't make a lot of sense, reducing uh, the business tax to six and a half percent. We need to attract business. And they never say when they leave that they're leaving. They, they move a headquarters someplace else, then all of a sudden half the jobs go, and then they're gone. And that's not a healthy atmosphere. If we are going to have a better educational system, a better health system, uh, a better social structure, when we need people who are making money in this state, paying salaries, and able to support our infrastructure. Um, education, great stories. You've written a lot about that. Higher education, what we've done for TAP and what we've done for the community colleges, it's, it's been very difficult to get it all done, to get it done on time. I, I, I again emphasize, it makes government work. Uh, there are adults working, they, they put forward their views, uh, we, we harmonize those views, we come to compromises, but also we accomplish great things. And with that, I just want to make note that the Senate has a coalition with the IDC, and it's not easy. Um, we, we did not all join the same political party together, but we've made it work, and it, we made it work again, and so I'd like to turn this over to the leader of the IDC, Jeffrey Klein. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Hanna, and I want to thank our governor, uh, Governor Cuomo, for outstanding leadership, uh, my fellow leader, Senator Skelos, and of course, uh, Speaker Sheldon Silver. Uh, you know, I had the privilege of uh, growing up uh, in a two-family home in the Bronx uh, with my grandparents. Uh, I watched my father and grandfather work very, very hard. Uh, but as hard as they worked, uh, government was always there to kind of lend a helping hand. Uh, they were able to afford to pay their mortgage. Uh, they were able to send uh, their kids and grandkids to college. Uh, they were even able to put a little money aside uh, to retire. Uh, but unfortunately, the good old days are just that. Uh, they've become fond memories. But I think today, uh, all of that really changes. And I think uh, Governor Cuomo uh, deserves a tremendous a lot of credit. I've been in the legislature now for 19 years. And Senator Hannon said it best. I remember times uh, we didn't pass a budget until October. Uh, we used to come back every two weeks over the summer to do extenders uh, to keep government running. Uh, that's not the way to do business. Uh, the people deserve better. Uh, gridlock and paralysis is really behind us. And I think uh, the way we're doing it now uh, is really what the people deserve. And I think this budget uh, really represents a very simple truth, uh, that negotiation is not a dirty word. Uh, it's an important part of governing. And I think we approve that. And we finally, in this budget, I believe, uh, made New York affordable uh, for all New Yorkers. Uh, universal pre-K. Uh, we kept our promise uh, and created a statewide universal pre-K program uh, that I believe is going to be second to none. Uh, $300 million uh, dedicated uh, to New York City uh, to make sure we have the highest standards and keep our promise to 54,000 four-year-olds uh, who will now have full-time universal pre-K. Uh, universal pre-K is a game changer. Uh, it has an impact on a young person's life uh, the rest of their life uh, in uh, better education, uh, better grades, better school, uh, making sure they have a promising life. Uh, that's something that I think is a major accomplishment. Uh, child care subsidies. Uh, we, for the first time over six years, restored over $55 million uh, in child care subsidies, enabling 5,000 working families uh, to be able to deal with the uh, high child care costs. Uh, it's not only that we're giving these families the ability uh, to have safe and affordable child care, uh, this is really an economic development tool. Uh, these are individuals, uh, because of the lack of child care, wouldn't be able to go out uh, into the workforce. So I think that's something that's extremely, extremely important. Uh, part of this budget, uh, we're creating a statewide $300 million housing program, uh, housing for the homeless, affordable housing. Uh, making sure we help those uh, who suffered from foreclosure. Uh, and more importantly, uh, we're going to create uh, the first, or bring back, I should say, uh, an excellent housing program, uh, mitchell in the form of mitchell 2020. Uh, I think we realize in this housing program uh, that we have to protect the middle class. If you look uh, around our state, uh, it's the middle class that's being priced out, uh, their inability uh, to find decent housing. Uh, I think we fulfilled this promise uh, in this year's budget as well. Uh, seniors. You know, every time I talk to seniors in my district or wherever I go, uh, it's becoming very, very expensive uh, to be able to retire uh, in New York. So uh, we actually expanded the SCRE program, uh, making sure we have rent freezes for seniors in New York City and other areas of the state. 
Uh, we expanded the EPIC program to make sure senior citizens can afford prescription drugs. Uh, that's something that's extremely important. Campaign finance reform. Uh, as the governor mentioned, uh, we accomplished the first step, uh, but I don't think we're done yet. Uh, I believe that uh, we need to be committed uh, to passing a more comprehensive campaign finance system before the close of the legislative session. Uh, again, I want to thank everyone involved. Uh, this was uh, my second experience uh, in the uh, budget negotiations, and uh, thanks uh, to the leadership of our governor, uh, he kind of makes it look easy. Uh, but it really is important work uh, because, once again, we kept our commitment to New Yorkers. Uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, someone uh, who I had the privilege of uh, serving with in the Assembly for 10 years. Uh, I think his encyclopedic knowledge of uh, government uh, and the way Albany works uh, gets us through all these tough times in budget negotiations. Our speaker, Speaker Sheldon Silver. Thank you very much, Senator Klein. And Governor, I want to congratulate you, Senator Skelos, Senator Klein, and all of our colleagues in the legislature on delivering to the citizens of this Empire State a fourth consecutive on-time budget. Governor, you gave us a well-crafted blueprint from which to work. And we in the Assembly appreciate your willingness to consider our priorities throughout the budget negotiations. So I want to say I am extremely proud of my colleagues in the Assembly majority. From day one, they were wholeheartedly committed to putting working families first. We're proud that our perseverance in the 2014-15 state budget makes a strong commitment to the education of our children, particularly our students in high-need school districts across the state <coughs> through a dramatic investment in school aid, well over $1 billion in the next academic year. An equally dramatic statewide investment in universal pre-K 600 million of which over the next two years will help Mayor de Blasio launch his full day pre-K program throughout the city of New York. We were gratified that we could reach agreement on a $2 billion school, smart schools bond act, which will give students across our state the latest educational technology and also help New York City our largest school district to alleviate the school overcrowding and get many of the students, our workforce of tomorrow, out of school trailers and into the proper classroom learning environments that they deserve. After being deluged with concerns from parents, students, teachers throughout New York State, we are pleased that this agreement hits the pause button on the Common Core and protect student privacy along the lines of an assembly bill that we passed earlier this month. On the subject of tax relief for working families, we said from the beginning that any property tax relief action has to be fair to all of the taxpayers in our state. This final agreement on that is fair geographically, it's fair economically, and it covers all of our citizens in the state. Economic development is always a top priority. This agreement expands the state's aggressive and innovative efforts to create jobs, to attract and retain business, and to revitalize and modernize the upstate economy. But it also takes an important step toward addressing the child care crisis that affects every region of our state by increasing child care subsidies so that parents, particularly our working mothers, are able to take jobs or keep jobs because reliable, secure, affordable, and high quality child care will be available to them. I want to thank the members of the Assembly Child Care Working Group, which I convened last May, and which came up with a package, much of which is incorporated in this budget. Having sponsored legislation to implement public financing of campaigns for over three decades, let me add that I'm pleased that this agreement provides for the testing of the idea. 
and includes other actions that the assembly majority has long believed will make our elections fairer. We will continue to work to bring full campaign finance reform to the state of New York, including the financing of all state public offices. There are many other elements of this budgetary agreement that are longtime assembly priorities. The increase in TAP, the COLA for our direct care workers, the Safe Patient Handling Act. But let me make one important additional point. I am disappointed that this agreement could not include an agreement on the DREAM Act. We will continue to work for its enactment so that all of our young people, wherever they were born, will know that their talents and their aspirations matter and are valued in the state of New York. In closing, I want to publicly thank the distinguished chair of the Assembly's Ways and Means Committee, Assemblymember Denny Farrell, who did an extraordinary job of leading the debate on these budget bills. My thanks as well to our Majority Leader, Assemblyman Joe Morelli, to our Minority Leader, Assemblyman Brian Kolb, and to all of our committee chairs. On a personal note, I do want to thank my staff, led by Jim Yates, Luann Saccone, Matt Howard, Judy Rapfogel, and all of the staff who couldn't be here this morning because they're sleeping for the first time in about a week. <laughs> This budget is fiscally prudent, socially responsible. It will keep our state on the path to a better future for our children, for our working families, who are the backbone of our state. Again, Governor, my congratulations for a job well done. Thank you. Thank you. Nicely said. And let's sign the bill now. At this time, so, uh, uh, what has happened the last couple of weeks, did it seem to you like this budget was a little more fraught than you do on other words? What were you thinking last night when the assembly was going to hear it close to you? You know, the assembly always keeps you on the edge of your seat, Zach. I think it's the nature of the assembly. Uh, but um, I, felt, I felt good about the outcome. You know, when you look at, when you look at the uh, votes, I don't believe we passed a budget by larger margins than this budget passed. Um, it was virtually unanimous in the Senate, very, very big in the Assembly. And that, you could feel that all along, that people felt good about the plan and about the direction and about the intelligence of the budget. We had some political issues that were dropped in the middle of the discussion, if you will. Uh, charter schools was a difficult conversation. Pre-K was a difficult conversation. So you had probably uh, 
more hot button political issues that arose in the course of the budget negotiation. Uh, so that made it more difficult. But fundamentally, from the announcement of the, when I did the State of the State, I had already spoken to both houses and had a good sense of what they wanted to accomplish for the year. So the State of the State presentation, as the speaker mentioned, had a balanced blueprint in it to begin with. And it was basically a, a case of refining it. But there's no doubt there were political uh, hotspots. And I think that's why even more credit to the, uh, the leadership of my colleagues uh, in the Assembly and the Senate, because it is an election year. It was a uh, political, you had political hotspots, uh, but they got the job done anyway. Governor, you earlier said that um, MC pay raises would be looked at in the budget. It seems to have fallen off the table. Do you know what happened with that? Yeah. Uh, Bob or Larry, do you know? They'll, they'll take place administratively after the budget's passed. Uh, Andrew Stewart Cousins and Brian Cole were not included at any of the meetings when you wrote the budget. Would that have made more difficult to, uh, to make the deadline? Uh, well, we, everybody was consulted, uh, but I think uh, going back historically, it's the majorities in both houses uh, that basically uh, drive the process. Uh, bringing along the minority uh, and consulting the minority, but it's the majorities in both houses that drive the process. I think that's always been the way. I think it's the majority in both houses. Whoever's in the majority, if you're a majority leader, you'll be there. Governor Rob Asterino just put out a statement on the budget saying that it raises spending instead of cutting it, and he says that, uh, quote, um, Governor Cuomo, quote, is using public dollars to try to buy votes and appeal to special interests. And he says um, that he would try to find a healthy balance between what the state needs and what it can afford. Yeah, that's nice. Why wasn't it in the budget? You know, public finance, as the speaker said, uh, is a difficult issue. It's an issue uh, that has been discussed for 30 years. And there is a difference of opinion on public finance. And you have a very strong feeling, especially in the Senate, that public finance is not the right direction to go. Um, I support public finance. A number of people do. But make no mistake, um, there is a strong uh, opposition to public finance. Uh, at the end of the day, I don't believe the votes exist in both houses to pass public finance. Uh, and that's a fundamental issue. You know, we had a discussion yesterday. There are two types of problems that you can run into in state government. The first problem is inaction, that the, the process doesn't work. We've had that for many years in New York, and you just don't have votes taken. That's not the case. The process is working, we take votes. Second problem is fundamental. You don't have the, you don't have the votes, you don't have the support. And that's the prob problem with public finance. We don't have the votes uh, as we sit here today to pass public finance. Uh, I'm excited about the demonstration program. I believe it is a good first step. It's more of a step than we have taken in 30 years, right? Well, is it enough of a step no, not for me. Uh, it is for some, but not for me. But it is a first step. We're going to keep pushing. We're going to keep working. I'd like to do more. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's a difficult issue. Make no mistake about that. Don't presume that everyone understands uh, the wisdom that some people profess for the public finance system, because it's not the case. Governor, why is the pot of money uh, for university pre k uh, so small and for the rest of the state in Long Island and upstate, for about nearly 700 school districts compared to Long Island. We, yeah, overall, we have one, I believe it's $1.5 billion in the mm. pre K program over years. So we are heavily invested and committed to universal pre K. Uh, this is, uh, we're going where we've never gone before. We're starting a program, we're starting an approach. We have to watch the implementation rate and how fast 
uh, we can actually make universal pre-K a reality and where. But we have the funding to uh, move the program at the pace the localities can move the program. It's not going to be a question of money. We have the funding. It's going to be a question of how quickly we can operationalize the program. And we've increased the requirements and definition of pre-K. We don't want babysitting programs. We're making a big investment. We want quality pre-K programs, and we've changed the regulations to, uh, uh, to uh, impress that. But as, uh, as quickly as the localities move, we will be able to move. I would be delighted if upstate New York needed more funding to do more pre-K. That'd be, a, frankly, from my point of view, that would be a good thing if they actually exceeded expectations to operationalize the program. Well, you're assuming an implementation rate, and we'll see. I hope you're right, and that we put more money in the budget next year. Governor, students are taking the state assessment starting today. Um, you know, a lot of parents have talked that their children not be taking these tests. Do you think the reforms within the budget will change the mind or do you think they're still in school and they will be done? I think the, look, uh, most, almost, uh, it's virtually unanimous among educators that Common Core is the right direction to go. 45 states have opted into Common Core. The question wasn't, uh, is Common Core the right direction? The question was, are we moving too quickly? And are the students prepared, were the teachers prepared to now have Common Core testing and that grade goes on the transcript, the permanent transcript? That was the question. And what we said today, and I think many parents haven't heard this yet, just because of the process, uh, the test scores won't count. And I think that should, uh, 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 people can, uh, parents can now exhale and students can exhale. The test scores don't count. It's not taking of the test. I'm sure some students don't want to sit through it, but the test scores won't be on the transcript. And I think that will bring a sense of security and relief, frankly, to many students and many parents. What's your reservation about the investment tax credit? I'm sorry? What's your reservation about the investment tax credit? Which investment tax credit? The education. Oh, the education investment tax credit. Um, you know, there is a, first, everything is money. Uh, I think it has a lot of positive points. Um, it's money, and uh, we, money is in, is a precious commodity uh, in any budget. Uh, and it's a balance between the public education system and funding private education. But I think it's a proposal that has a lot of merit uh, that we discussed at length. I'm sure we're going to continue to discuss it. Uh, but we did not have a positive conclusion in this budget. Can you provide some uh, uh, details on what your plan is going forward for college courses for prison inmates and just why that wasn't ultimately in the budget? I think we've had good experience with prison courses uh, in college. There was a feeling uh, primarily in the uh, Senate that it should, uh, it should not be, we should not be using public funds to provide college courses in prison. Uh, that many families are struggling to pay for college and we shouldn't be using public funds to provide college courses in prison. Uh, I understand the sentiment. I don't agree with it, but I understand it uh, and I understand the appearance of it. It actually saves taxpayers money because the recidivism rate is so much lower when you provide education in prison for an inmate. Uh, one of the big problems we have now, we're reducing the prison population, it's down about 5,000, but the recidivism rate is almost 50%. So you release, and it's the revolving, revolving door, and then they come back. A jail cell, prison cell, costs about $60,000 per year. $60,000 per year. So if you were just doing this on the economics, it is less expensive for the taxpayer to pay for education courses in college than uh, dealing with the recidivism rate. But uh, there was a, a certain uh, uh, appearance issue and symbolism. Uh, so I agreed with the uh, legislature that we would do the programs in colleges. They would be private and they would be privately funded by not-for-profits and charitable organizations. Governor, 
but we won't use public funds to fund those courses in college. Now, how has the battle over pre-K and charters and some of the other things impacted your relationship with the mayor? And do you think it's, uh, it's an impacted moving forward? No. I, uh, I've known the mayor for over 20 years. He's a personal friend. I have tremendous respect for him and affection for him. Uh, we've been together a long time. And uh, this is a very good outcome for New York City and for New York State. Uh, the mayor talked very early on about pre-K, and he was eloquent about it, and he was also correct about it. And we're going to be funding pre-K in New York City. Um, so I think it was uh, a positive outcome all around. Nobody said being mayor of New York is easy. Nobody said being governor of New York is easy. Uh, and they're not. It's not easy. So, uh, but it's all, all's well that ends well. And uh, I think the mayor should be applauded. And I think New York City is taking a big step forward with pre-K. So I think it's all good. And you support his push for the 120 traffic cameras, the uh, red light? We did not get to that in this budget, uh, but we will, and we will shortly. Governor, why was the design bill uh, portion taken out of the budget? Because we did not have agreement, Betty, yet, I hope to get agreement. It's an important program for the state, uh, but we could not get it done in this budget. You know, there are many important things, brownfield legislation, there are many important initiatives that we still need to get done that become difficult, and you want to keep the budget moving, and you want to keep the process moving, so sometimes you take an issue and you put it on the side and say, we'll do that after the budget. Design build, brownfields were two such examples. Uh, uh, funds about, did it end up being about $30 million? What was that for exactly? What was it taken out of the MTA budget for? Bob, do you know, Larry, do you know? Not sure, Not sure what you're. Exactly. You have stumped Bob Magnusak. <laughs> Very rarely happens, yeah, but you get a baseball for stumping Bob Magna. They don't know the question. <laughs> no, they didn't hear the question. Why was the 30 million? What's the 30 million? The MTA I think money. One for? one of the pieces that we had in the budget was that you know the state was paying debt service for the MTA, and I think as part of the budget negotiations, we decided to leave some of that money with the MTA instead of taking all of it out. So I think it was really just, it went from 40, I think, to, to 30. You did not stump Bob Magna. You do not get the baseball. But the offer is still open. Anyone who can stump Bob Magna gets this great grand slam baseball autographed. signed and autographed by yours truly. The, we have a corporate tax cut uh, across the board, from about 7.1 to about 6.5. We have a manufacturer's uh, cut to zero. Why? Because we're trying to, uh, we are trying to grow business in the state. We're trying to attract business. We're trying to keep business here. One of the liabilities this state has is high taxes. Uh, and I've said from day one that high taxes, uh, we don't have a rosy economic future as long as we're one of the highest tax states in the country. We're working very hard to turn that around. Also, we have the complication of our tax code. We had a tax simplification commission, if you remember. Not only do we ch charge high taxes, the code is immensely complex and overly complicated. Uh, so simplifying the code in and of itself was an attraction. It's not accurate. What it says is that for certain securities that all businesses may hold, but financial securities that are very difficult to source to New York, that a safe harbor is put in place which the business can elect to use to source that particular income to New York. When it's sourced to New York, they pay at the regular rate. That is something that's a benefit both to the tax department and to the taxpayer because on those particular financial instruments, it's very, very difficult to source the income. I think a lot of people raised that issue. I think when they sat down at the table and understood what was really going on, it became clear that it was the right thing to do. 
but it's not all securities income. It is a very small piece. Held in certain situations, but not the income earned by the entity. Question. You did not stump Bob McNutt. You do not get a baseball. You do get a follow-up question on the telephone because I got lost somewhere along the way. Okay, what's the question? Um, just a, back to the, the campaign finance question, Governor. Obviously, you ran into some resistance in the budget, whereas you previously indicated there is leverage, right? The budget train leaves the station. You want to put things on the budget train. Um, how are we going to get action on some of these issues where there may not be the votes, or are we just have to try again when there's a new legislation? No, Jimmy, if you don't have the votes, it is not a question of calling the vote or taking a vote. You have a deeper problem. You don't have the vote, right? Uh, public finance, we have been fighting about for 30 years. This is the largest single advancement we have made in public finance in 30 years. There is a demonstration using public finance money. Well, the advocates want more. So do I. That doesn't mean it's not the largest uh, step forward in terms of public finance in 30 years. It is. And we hope to do more and we hope to do better. But the conversation can't assume the uh, unquestioned intelligence of public finance is the right direction. It is a controversial topic publicly, and currently it is without legislative support. And that is the fundamental issue that we're dealing with. And we're going to continue to work on it, continue to talk to individual members, try to change their mind, try to educate them. Um, it's not that this is not a discussion they haven't heard before, right? It's not the first top, first time we're broaching this topic. But we will continue the discussion. Senator Jeff Klein has made it very clear uh, that this is a priority for him personally and for the IDC. Uh, and they've been very aggressive about advancing the dialogue, and that will continue. As the Speaker mentioned, the same thing on the DREAM Act. DREAM Act is something many of us believe in. Uh, many of us do not. But it's another one of those issues where the vote, uh, the votes are not there. How do you know? Because the vote was taken and the votes were not there. But we believe in and we're going to continue to work very hard. Yeah, we're we're going to going to We have to deal with the issue of the effect of Common Core testing on teacher evaluations. Uh, and the, if you said Common Core testing was premature for students and you just halted the grades on the transcript, then what is your opinion uh, about the impact of Common Core testing on teacher evaluations and what should be done? That is an issue that we have not addressed and we need to address before the end of session, in my opinion, depending on what happens. Would any of my colleagues like to add in on anything that's come up? Just a follow-up on the campaign finance. All the things you said, the same things could have been said about gay marriage, but you brought senators down to your office and you convinced them that it would be a better idea to have a gay marriage than to have a gay marriage. Are you planning on doing anything like that now? I have been doing that. And the difference with gay marriage is this. We had the votes. Public finance, no, but we had the votes. We don't have the votes for public finance. We've had the same conversations, but we don't have the votes. Also, marriage equality was a fairly new topic that was being broached to people who, in, in some cases, hadn't really wrestled with the issue yet. Public finance, as the speaker mentioned, has been a 30-year debate. It's not like you have a conversation with a legislator and you say, I want to talk to you about public finance. There may be something you don't know. These are legislators who have debated this issue for years and years. Uh, and it's much easier said than done to say, well, you should talk to a senator about public finance. Maybe you can change their mind. So a marriage equality, we had the votes. Uh, safe, New York SAFE Act, we had the votes. DREAM Act, we don't have the votes. Public finance, we don't have the votes. And that's the issue.
some people are going to be gathering here today to protest against the same fact that you just mentioned. What's your reaction to the really vehement opposition that this law has spawned over the last year? I think, Bob, it's, it's not over the past year. Uh, this issue has uh, driven strong feelings on both sides for decades. Um, I spoke over the telephone at an event for uh, Carolyn McCarthy, Congresswoman on Long Island, last night. I worked with her in Washington. She's retiring. Uh, she ran for Congress because her husband uh, was killed uh, on the uh, LIRR. Uh, by a gun attack, and that brought her to the U.S. Congress. I worked with her in Washington on this issue uh, you know, 15 years ago, uh, and the feelings were very strong then. Bill Clinton, I was in the Clinton administration, passed the assault weapon ban, et cetera. St feelings were very strong then. It's a topic that drives strong emotions. Uh, like many topics, uh, woman's right to choose, strong emotions. Dream Act, by the way, strong emotions. Uh, so I understand it. Um, but it's the nature of the discussion. Governor, there are lots of groups on the political left that are unhappy with this budget, either because of the tax cuts or because they feel public financing should have gone a lot further. Um, the Working Families Party is making noise that they're not going to give you their ballot line. Just with the risk of asking a political sounding question, what, what do you make of a lot of this opposition that is arising from these left-leaning organizations? The, there are groups that support public finance that are disappointed that it hasn't passed. By the way, they've been disappointed then for 30 years that it hasn't passed, right? Uh, and you can celebrate that this is the greatest advancement that has been made, or you can say uh, we're disappointed that we haven't had a total victory. Um, and, as I said, we'll continue to work at it, and I hope to have a greater accomplishment, uh, maybe before the end of session, but we don't yet have the votes, and we have to continue to work to get the votes. You know, that's a, it's a fundamental factor of democracy, that you need the votes to pass a bill. Well, we don't have the votes, but we want it to pass anyway. That's a problem. You know, that's just a problem in life. Well, get them to vote for it. You know, how? Public finance, somebody has deeply held views that it's the wrong direction to go. Ran saying, for office telling people, I will never support it. You know, it is an issue. Governor, on the uh, Act, uh, part of their complaint is that your office has not released the number of uh, guns that have been registered thus far with the registration deadline coming up uh, in a couple weeks. Do you have those numbers? <coughs> and if so, do you plan on releasing them? I don't know, Pat. I don't know. Do you know Larry or Bob? I don't know. Governor, is the Moreland Commission going to be shut down now? And does that, do you worry that that could open the door to more abuse in the future? Without the <coughs> no. The Moreland Commission will be shut down. I said all along if we passed a Public Trust Act, the Moreland Commission would be shut down. Let's remember uh, where the uh, Moreland Commission was uh, birthed. Last session, we did a Public Trust Act. Uh, for me, uh, one of the main points of the Public Trust Act was the Board of Elections was ineffective as an enforcement vehicle because the Board of Elections was gridlocked. And some of the laws, according to the district attorneys, like the bribery law, was basically unenforceable in the state of New York. So I said to the legislature, if you leave last session, <clears throat> excuse me, and do not pass a Public Trust Act before you leave, I will appoint a Moreland Commission to do that enforcement function that I believe is not being done by the Board of Elections and the bribery laws and the ineffective disclosure laws. That's why I Moreland was the response to not passing the Public Trust Act because there was a void in enforcement. The Moreland Commission would be the enforcement mechanism. The legislature left last year without passing the Public Trust Act. Surprised me, actually. And I then appointed the Moreland Commission. I said at that time, if we pass a Public Trust Act, then I would end the Moreland Commission. The Moreland Commission functioned for a year. I think they did good work. I think they did a good, good report. I think they informed the dialogue. We passed the Public Trust Act that accomplished what we set out to accomplish last year real enforcement of the Board of Elections, 
change the bribery laws so that district attorneys have a tool to enforce, more disclosure laws, et cetera. And uh, I've said consistently, if we pass that law, that we would end Moreland, uh, and we have. And I told the Moreland Commission that from day one, right? It's a conversation we had from the very beginning. Speaker, Last I one. Ask Speaker Silver, a question. Please. Okay. Because I'm exhausted. You have Speaker you, Silver. You have a lot of seats open in the assembly. <clears throat> How were those folks take you know in those districts taken into account? How was their needs taken into account? And also in the budget, do you have anything that helps the little leagues and helps what used to be member items, uh, museums and that sort of thing? Do you have any way of helping on the micro level? Uh, the neighborhoods in the areas that are uh, uh, open seats. Uh, I think there should I'm be more forget, member items. I'm going to forget your first question. <laughs> uh, but as far as the open seats, most of the open seats were created by people being elected to other offices within their district. Their offices are still available. Uh, most of them are city council members now. One is a borough president. Uh, and you know, they're used to going to the same elected officials, so the service is available in most of those districts, and they're not shy about calling and giving us their opinion on what the uh, budget would be. Um, I have said it publicly before in answer to your second question that I believe members know their districts better than anybody else uh, in state government, and with the appropriate um, safeguards, the vetting processes that we have put in place, uh, I believe it's not inappropriate for members to be able to use their discretion in finding the places where particular state grants are not covered in order to help out their own district. And that's an ongoing dialogue that I think uh, is shared by the Senate, and to some extent I think the governor recognizes that that should be a priority. Are you going to hold any special election dates before November? Uh, not, it, not, in, not in our current plan, Betty. Sure, no. Senator Hannon, Senator uh, Klein, any final thoughts? No? Okay. Thank you all very much. Thank you.